Okay, I'll go quickly through some of this. The regenerative piece of healing anything, anybody, any situation is extremely complex and takes all of the pieces of the puzzle into the equation. When I started this way back when, um, I learned that I probably asked for the wrong thing at the beginning because what I said is I want to be the best healer I possibly can be. And I, did, I had no idea what that was going to encompass. I didn't say I want to be the best regenerative doc. I didn't say I want to be the best injectionist. I said I want to be the best healer I possibly can be. And part of the, my genesis through that whole thing is taking me into learning, I mean, doing four or five conferences just on how to do physical therapy techniques, how to do uh, functional medicine techniques, how to do psychoenergetic healing models, how to do dietary therapies. And it's funny how this all arranged itself over time because what it is gave me enough depth of understanding in each of the pieces of healing for me to say, that's the really, really awesome person that I need to work with. That is, that is, that is, that is where he's gone. <laughs> <coughs> to bring this together into a whole. And, and that concept, of course, is it takes a village. Um, yeah, you're gonna see, I'm gonna show you my brag slide where I'm telling you my whole history of I've done regeneratively. And all I keep kept coming up to is, I can go so far with regenerative injections, but then this is getting in the way of, of the person being able to regenerate this, that. I kept meeting up against these different barriers that somebody else needed to take care of. Because one of two things had to happen, either I had to find somebody else to do it or I had to find out how to do mitosis of myself and I don't think the world can take more than one of me. <laughs> but this is this is where I, way back when, I always thought about the things from this perspective. I remember being in residency in my second year, this is 2004, a uh, new guy came in as the uh, sports medicine director and said, okay, here's the person's problem. And a physical therapist looks at it like this, occupational therapy like this, chiropractors like this, sports medicine doctors like this, surgeons like this, and all these people need to work together if they really want to get this person better. And I went, you know, the clouds parted and the sunshine came down and there was heavenly music and I'm like, somebody gets it. And, and I can actually call that person a mentor. Uh, but it's an uncommon thought pattern to think holistically, cumulatively, to think one plus one plus one equals 111. Did this in Colorado, where about the first five years I was doing regenerative injections, I became the national expert essentially in how to do ultrasound fluoroscopic and arthroscopic guided injections. And, and then started hitting these walls. This is where we started to add hormones and dietary and physical therapy and chiropractic, and then started to create that village around people. Little did I know that uh, when I came here, um, little by little, I, I kept meeting these individuals that were selfless, excellent in what they do, I mean, amazing what they do, and were really looking to collaborate with other individuals. Jen and I had this over four years ago, we were sitting there, we were looking at each other, first time we met each other, and we're like, oh my God, you're the one I've really been looking for to work with. And Carrie and I had that experience. Chris and I, you know, we, Kathy and I, we all had, Dennis and I, we all had this experience. Now when people come here to do regenerative therapies, they see all the other providers first. And, and they all say the same thing to me when I see them. They look at me and they go, how the heck did you find all of these people to work with? And I said, I didn't do it. They just showed up. I need them and they showed up. Like I said, first, the most common question that I get from people, and I don't get it, why this is such a question, Mark and I were just talking about this. Uh, when somebody comes in and says, you know, my life was going really good, and then I took these, you know, this weak of antibiotics, and then my life went like this. What about our mental system, or, you know, our line of thinking said, we don't get to listen to the patient, and we have to go around them 18 different directions to make sure that they're wrong. Or even worse yet, because we don't know it and we don't recognize it, then the patient is coming in more educated than us. We have to look at them and say, well, you're crazy because that's impossible because if I don't know it, it can't exist. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, yeah, the Flaxies in the room are snickering appropriately. 
Oh, why should we add some regenerative components to what we're doing? Yes, it's effective. Minimally invasive, or I really can't what I call what I do minimally invasive anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's truly what I call microsurgical, because microsurgical sounds kind of sexy. And moderately invasive doesn't sound very good. It does overall decrease costs. It's not that what I do is cheap, but overall it's less costly than doing a surgery or somebody losing productivity for years or somebody you know, having to do a $70,000 assessment at the you know, clinic to be told that they can't be, they can't be diagnosed with something because the code doesn't exist. <clears throat> Definitely faster recoveries from multiple different directions, maintains and heals your native tissue, creating the foundation for healing and restoration function, the platform from which proper alignment neuromuscular function can occur. <clears throat> and then ideally, it addresses the underlying neurologic, mechanical, psychologic, and physiologic reasons for the pain and dysfunction. That's what everybody else has been talking about. And I put it in this order, why? Because if, I, if we do all of the physiologic assessment work and heal the body chemically as much as possible, guess what, the stem cells are in much better shape and the body's ability to heal is in much better shape. I would much rather have somebody partway through that process, at least partway through that process before I'm doing regenerative therapies on them, than just shoot them up with a bunch of cells and see what happens. The, the era of throwing it against the wall and seeing what happens with regenerative therapies for me ended in about 2012. Yeah. And, and you know, I've never looked back. It's how you stratify and create this in the best order possible since that point in time. I love that. Putting the pieces together. All right, here's my brain slide. I'm gonna let you guys all read it because I don't like talking about myself too much. Well, I do. Yeah, say, <laughs> 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 I'm gonna put you in timeout. <laughs> All right. So I had this funny schism in my in my career where I created a tremendous amount of stuff in Colorado, Regenics, uh, Centennial Schultz Clinic, the first clinic in the country that was doing regenerative therapies. They created about 80% of their injection therapies. Um, their international clinic, the fellowship, the international and national consortium of physicians, trained them all from the ground up. And working constantly by passion. It's like 15 or 16 hours a day just with like constantly being on, you know, in sixth gear and loving it. And then for various reasons, uh, we parted ways. And it wasn't the best thing ever that happened because for the last five years, all I've done is recombine, redefine, and put together things in ways that I probably never would have if I would have stayed there. And it's now very complex, very complete, very personalized, and very directed in, the, in, a, in, a, in a way that is entirely focused on how do I help somebody heal one individual at a time. Of those 300 plus physicians that I trained, there are about five of them that are somewhat like me that have this ability to have this very, very broad-minded, uh, uh, broad-minded uh, view of how to approach a person, and it takes all those pieces into account. Basic components of regenerative therapies: doing detailed histories and physical examinations. When was the last time you were? in a physician's office open for more than five minutes. Ten minutes, maybe. Or have them touch you. Screen. So my initial evaluations are an hour and a half to two hours. Um, for the people who haven't seen this presentation before, doing a detailed history and physical examination with all those components versus specific procedural set or doing regenerative therapies, what percentage do each contribute to the person's healing? <coughs> <laughs> At the very least, if I don't know where to go and what places, what what things are actually working in the situation of their degeneration, I can't get them better if I don't inject each part of the way it needs to be injected. 
the idea of of having this really great procedural set, but not knowing where to go or why, is goofy. And it's hard to get physicians to to think about that first set of things because it takes a heck of a lot longer. It's much faster to just look at an MRI and say, okay, it's that disc. We're going to schedule you on Friday for a disc injection. But what, 50 or 60 percent of 50 year olds have degenerative discs that are asymptomatic? So why inject something that's actually not part of the symptomatic problem? This is why actually I'll, I'll make angry a lot of uh, a lot of radiologists because I just tell them you have no business doing regenerative injections. You have no idea how to assess a patient. You do everything by imaging. That's not sufficient. We're, we're used to in medicine thinking about people like this. Oh, there's that one problem right there. That's it. That's the diagnosis. They have knee arthritis. So I'm going to inject some stem cells into that, and then they're all better. We need to think a little more like the second one. What is the process that this occurred in? So here's how I complexify the situation. The fundamental factors of deterioration, there are five of them. Let me see how the other people who haven't seen my presentations. I want to see who can get the five things that truly lead to our deterioration. Start going them up. Yes. Right. <clears throat> Birth trauma. Say again? Birth trauma. You was born. You were born. You mean injury. cause? Injury. So, Brenda, that's injury. Injury, sorry. Age. Age. That's part of chemistry or physiology. Starvation. Starvation. Mm. Nutrient. That's part of chemistry, physiology. Okay. Mental output. Psychoenergetic. Environment. Part of chemistry. Trauma. Trauma, not part of injury. Occupational exposure. Stress. Environmental exposure. Part of chemistry. <clears throat> Genetics. Yeah. <laughs> Nutrition. Part of chemistry. Neurologic function. What are all five again? Immunologic function. Yeah, immunologic per function, part of chemistry. So injuries, genetics, psychoenergetic state, psychoemotional state, uh, neurologic function, and chemistry. chemistry of the body, Physi chemistry and physiology of the body. Those are the roots that ultimately I believe we need to be addressing, which is why there are all those things represented around us. Except for the psychoenergetic piece, or psycho-emotional piece, pain, pain wrote her will be here later, knock your socks off, gifted healer. After we get these, I'm very convinced that one of the biggest things that the body does that gets in the way of us being able to heal is our sympathetic nervous system goes crazy. Um, that's the fight or flight nervous system. It becomes the governor for what we are essentially allowed to do, how we're able to move physiologically what happens at the site of tissues and everybody I do procedures on now I'm doing sympathetic work on them uh, by injections and by a, um, a deep uh, intuitive emotional healing and by a even regular psych psychology kind of work next rung Shannon neuromuscular derangement they start to fall apart. Their, their sympathetic nervous system, what I, this is what I call the, uh, uh, the unfortunate cascade. Uh, when a deep structure like a ligament, a tendon, a disc, a joint is irritated, the neurologic function and response to that is always the same. The deep musculature is inhibited, which is what Shannon was talking about, and the major mobilizing musculature is hyperstimulated. They get tight muscles and they're unstable. It's the body's response to trying to protect you, to splint you from what it's considering to be a traumatic injury. It doesn't understand the difference between the degenerative condition and a traumatic condition. So working on those very deep static stabilizing structures strongly augments the ability to work on the deep intrinsic um, uh, work that Shannon is doing. And these things have to happen in order because the neurologic system won't let you do it any other way. And then you get changes in alignment, recruitment, stress, accommodation patterns. 
a lot of the stuff that's more physical therapy, more chiropractically oriented. And these things get chased all around the body, all over the place. I was, I was trained in uh, selective functional movement assessment, which is a physical therapy modality, but I took the entire series because I loved the way Greg Cook thought this guy from Nevada doing this whole system of uh, training. And it was, you know, I don't care if your left knee hurts. It's never the problem. The symptomatic, symptomatic thing is never the problem. That's the, the tail that wings the dog. It's what part of the body is dysfunctionally moving, protected, and doesn't hurt. Because that's what your body started protecting and where the waves got further away from the body and then everything else gets beat up on. And guess what? For months or years, these things cycle around each other. And they keep changing. Everybody chases their tail. And they went to a massage therapist and they went to a, you know, somebody who makes you kiss rocks and throw them in a golden fountain or whatever. You know, there's a billion things that you can do to make somebody feel better as this keeps going around and around and around in a circle. And then eventually you start getting secondary problems, so distant away from the body. You start getting you know, you know, similar kinds of problems, but now it's very complex because there's this whole other ring of things that happen far away from the sites that were originally problematic. And then eventually, radiologic and symptomatic deterioration. This is where people are usually seeing orthopedic surgeons and saying, okay, you have knee arthritis, we need to do a total knee on you. What about everything else? What about all the other dominoes that got them there? This is why I end up being the, the, the take everything together that everybody else does. This is why the patients see everybody else first and then they see me and I try to put this all together and I try to be the, the guy that coordinates all this together. Because if you're going to heal somebody, you have to take it all into account. I can't get physicians to think like this. They're not trained this way, and they, and they it's, it's against their you know, pathway of, of obsessing and treating people. And it's, frankly, it's actually because I probably had 20 years of seizures, I had a seizure condition for 20 years, brain tumor removed 17 years ago, and, and I probably had all those brain tumors like mushed my brain back together in some weird way. That's my thought for why I do things as weirdly as I do. Because these things circle around each other for a while. And then after you get that total knee, then everything else goes back, you know, prime and pristine and you know it's back to its native tissue, right? I took care of everything you know, just put in that plastic and metal, right? Well my outcome say that you Everybody that I do told me I'm they're better, 80% better within one year. So, congratulations. This is all then the history of the physical examination. What happened? Why did it happen? Where the modulating things are put together, you know, in, in this whole pattern. This is where I'm not doing all of the history on everybody because I'm, everybody else is doing it, and I'm bringing it all together. And yes, I put hands on everybody, including an ultrasound. Now look at imaging on everybody. MRIs, we've talked about it a little bit already. Not my favorite for the neck, but but absolutely critical for the lumbar spine and for peripheral joints that we need to work on. Everything else, better by ultrasound. Um, soft tissue, nerves, fascia, tendons, ligaments, uh, muscle, lesions, all best evaluated by the ultrasound because why? Because I can look at it in real time. I can test it and strain it in real time. I can see how it moves in real time. And knowing what's normal and not normal, pretty dang important. I started doing that in 2007. Um, I have a practitioner from Colorado, John Hill, uh, long-term sports medicine guy, was giving a presentation at the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine, and he was very, very excitable. We got a guy, he makes dents look like he's tired. <laughs> Which is hard to do. John Hill's a very, very, very bouncy guy. <laughs> Dennis laughed at that. That was a good thing. I knew he would. Um, and he's up there and he's you know, in front of hundreds of people and he's bouncing around like a you know five year old kid going, Look what I can see, look what I can do, look at it. And I went, Oh man, I have to do this. And just so I one of the experts in the country is at Mayo Clinic, um, and I started taking courses from him in 2007. 
and haven't looked back since. I'm very glad I learned fluoroscopy first because the secondary anatomy of using bones to understand where you are was never sixth sense to me. And I had to grunt and grind through that for a couple of years to, to know what to do with it. Once I got ultrasound, I was like, I left fluoroscopy for quite a while. And it took a while to bring those things back together and know which one needed to be used, where, when, and how. I also do arthroscopy, so camera guidance by a you know, 1.7 millimeter um, camera that I can put into joints or even into soft tissue, sometimes releasing nerves under direct camera guidance. And of course, digital motion x-ray. I will not touch a neck without one of Dennis's digital motion x-rays. I've tried four or five guys around the country to do them instead of him, and I'm sorry, they can't do them. And then you put all that together, and that's like a 12 course meal. It's very complex. Um, as I said earlier, putting all these pieces together and, and have these very complex conditions, it, it, some reason my brain can handle that and likes it. I, I like to be challenged like that. But the nice part about that is I can take pretty much any condition that exists now in the neuromuscular system and what I've developed for fluoroquinolone toxicity, I can, I can pare that down and use it for that part of the body. That's sort of how it happened, as I said earlier. There's about these 12, 13 different conditions that all went into how we do fluoroquinolone toxicity regeneratively and now I'm just paring them down as I need to for other things. What's the ideal order? This is, a, this is an open question, actually. My bias is I want to see people physiologically and emotionally improving significantly. And then, then starting the neuromuscular um, the neuromuscular re-education and the alignment portions to get things moving where they need to go physiologically, emotionally, alignment, strength, stability, then do the regenerative injections. Uh, that's, that's my way that I look at it at this point in time. Hard to do that. Um, there are a lot of people who are like, they, they get very stuck on wanting to do something regenerative. And what I've learned over time is if I, if I try too hard to dissuade them in a different direction, then they kind of lose all interest and just be nothing. So sometimes I'll do something regenerative on them, talk them into doing this other pathway, and then do something more complete on them. There's a hundred different ways of doing this. I have my favorites, and those will continue to develop over time. Personalizing that plan, I've created what I call the healing paradigm. That's a lot of small print, but basically hierarchy, why, where are we going, why, where, when, in what order. That environmental niche, alignment, neuromuscular coordination, the lifestyle pieces. Of those five things that were in that first uh, that first little grouping that I called the, you know, the, the reasons for us deteriorating, which one of the five do you think I think is the most important one? Second one. <laughs> Carrie knows me. <laughs> As I said, I kept coming up against these walls and, and things that I didn't have in my original training that just kept coming up in people that I had to figure out a way to take care of. And the psycho-emotional piece of healing has been around about, well, it's been around about seven years and trying to be trying to incorporate at least a positive attitude in people. But in the last three years, and, um, it's developed where I will say, if you do not have that piece going, you will not heal physically. If you, if you can't have hope, if you can't have um, a basic desire and urge to, to be a better version of what you are, and get some of the, the deep scars, pains, um, you know, the, the kind of negative energies out of yourself, you can't heal. Mm, so Penny's gonna talk about that in greater detail because I have some tools for it, but he's, he's the gifted healer in actually taking care of that piece of it. Um, multiple, and including myself and the other providers, also have significant intuitive capacities to know, okay, this isn't just a knee, this isn't just a hip, this isn't just, some of that sixth sense in long-term treat, um, care and treatment of people, but the, there's also some giftedness in that, and I've learned to respect that over time. We're not just a brain, we're, we're a mind, we're a heart, we're a soul, and, and using those things and helping other people use those things as part of their treatment is exquisitely important. So 
you guys read those. I love that the grade of the defect came up last. I didn't do that purposely, but oftentimes that's the only thing that most of the other regenerative physicians are looking at is how bad is this? And you know, it's a knee, so which agent should I use? And let's do drive-through stem cells. By the way, anybody locally who knows anybody who works in a drive-through, everybody <laughs> want to do a picture of somebody that's sticking their leg out while somebody's going well, through a drive-through. <laughs> with, with somebody coming with a needle to them. <laughs> because that is what regenerative therapy has been, has been reduced to. Is, is, yeah, your knee, we'll just inject that, and, you know, $5,000 for these umbilical the 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 cells. Thing. Thank you for coming in. Anybody do that now to the doctor? You guys don't know who Apu is? Nobody Such watches The Simpsons? <laughs> a long time. Thank you. Come again. All right. I'm highly biased on this. What should our standard be for regenerative medicine? Um, having created a lot of what's out there. This is just my, this is my bias. This is a younger version of me on the Doctor's TV show in 2012. I saw that. It is real. <laughs> it's my five minutes of fame. I was in front of 30 million people. Real. Did you get some business from that? Uh, yeah, I was in Colorado at the time, and everyone was like, you're the guy who was on the doctor show. And the women all ask one question. You know what it is? Is Doctor Cute? Are you single? Oh, are you married? Oh, I'm married at Doctor Cute. Is Doctor Travis really hot? <laughs> oh, gee. As if you would know. <laughs> I'm like, I had a thousand freaking lights pointed in my eyes. I had no you idea what I looked like. like and it was all kind of a blur, thank you. <laughs> so the first guy that I trained in a fellowship format from 2011 to 12, a very, very smart guy, very um, high integrity guy, had already done a sports medicine fellowship with musculoskeletal ultrasound and PRP training in it. I spent an entire year with him, so about 250 days one-on-one, -on -one, teaching him how to do these procedures. And at the end of it, I said, Ben, of what I do, about how much do you think you can do? Want to guess how much he said? About 40%. 250 days of training. Most conferences are about three days of training. And to understand the nuances of all of the regenerative agents, how to make them, where to put them, which regenerative image guidance, guidance to use, how to, what to do with that needle while you're in there. <sighs> Having trained as many physicians as I have, I, I, I know that I'm on this weird end of the spectrum where I do things that are very difficult to do, but that's what I'm built to do. I mean, it's not to break, it's just, I can do it. Um, to train somebody really, really well, it's 60 PowerPoints on how to do this stuff. And it takes a good two years at least have a kind of basic understanding of how to approach somebody and how to do it. Gotta be able to use your own ultrasound. I don't like allogeneic units or agents, we'll get back to that in a second. Multidisciplinary care model and procedure outcomes being tracked. We've got two places nationally doing that. Many tools in the toolbox. I actually have an advisory board for my clinic at this point in time. It's like having an internal IRB saying, okay, this is what I'm gonna do with people, what do you think? So I have seven people that would sit down and say, well, I think you're crazy, but this looks okay. I think it's crazy, but you should really, you probably shouldn't do this. I went back, I went past this line, unfortunately. I got in the wrong order. Oops, I got that too many times. And these are the things I actually put together to create a paradigm for floor permal toxicity. So I had to create all of those things separately and then put them, be able to put them into one condition. This is why, uh, from a regenerative standpoint, fluoropamol toxicity is this complex. Incurred physiologically and neuromuscular alignment wise, why it's this complex. So those are all the, you know, the big paradigms that I put together into one. Microsurgical techniques, again, it's that sexy sort of sounding word. Nerve hydrodysections, sections, fascial plane restorations, tsunami procedures, cavalry, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so these are all like whole 
course on teaching somebody even just the basics of how to do all of each of these things. But, I mean, we're at the point now where if Shannon Sussman's going to help me put together essentially, I need tools to use to be able to even do the next steps of regenerative medicine because there's a bridge I got to get to to be able to do new things. Um, but injecting directly into inside the nerves, there's only two guys in the country meet another guy that do this. Um, and most people look at us like, you can't do that. I, eight years ago, I had a patient that had a radial nerve palsy and she was walking around like this for nine or for seven months. And, and she came to me, I did one set of regenerative injections around her radial nerve. And she was able to get a little bit of this. A couple, month, a couple months later, I did a second one. And a lot of those, I was developing a new technique for how to get around the nerves kind of efficiently. Um, efficiently in this case, actually, unfortunately meant that I got a little off of my needle and it ended up going inside the nerve. And all of a sudden I saw the nerve go like this. Uh, uh, I sat down with her and said, this is what happened. And, I just destroyed your nerve, and and she was a member of my own practice company, and over at check, and she calls me up the next morning and goes, "Guess what?" I said, "What?" And she went, "I can do this." And I went, "Really?" So hence was born intraneural injections. Oh, jeez. At the level of the spine and at the level of peripheral nerves, wherever lesions exist. Yes, I'm going directly inside of the nerves. Probably, in my opinion, probably treating and working on the glial cells, which are cells that modulate and actually propagate and improve the function of the nerves on the course of their axons working. It is the only way to get a lot of nerves to work appropriately. And that's in addition to injecting around nerves, loosening nerves up in the fascial planes. Nerves are wearing the body. If they're not working, nothing's going to work. Good capsules, bone grafting techniques, DNA procedures, and there's a ton to teach in there. I'm just gonna throw it up there. Just advanced microsurgical techniques. Mm. So this is just a common list of things that I do for say a patient that's for bone toxicity that's neck dominant. <coughs> that's, those are all the things that we be working on. Over a two day period of time, First day is actually on the right, second day is on the left. Mostly neurologic stuff on day one, mostly structural stuff on day two. On the order of 40 to 60 injection sites over about a three hour period of time. And each, every time I put a needle into somebody, it's not just put it in and inject something, it's what am I doing with that needle at the tip when it's under there? So that's where a lot of the, the advanced microsurgical techniques have come from. These are just common things that I inject into people. I'm not going over them because it's a whole weekend course for each of them. But platelet-rich plasma, from platelet-rich plasma, you get platelet lysate. That's breaking both of the platelets so that the growth factors are immediately available. Nerves love that. Um, alpha-2 macroglobulin. It's the biggest non-immunologic protein in the body, um, and it is really good, helpful for cartilage regeneration. Kits for it are about 1,500 bucks. It's in every PRP that I do on somebody. Marrow concentrate, I get three different fractions on marrow. I create some alveolar concentrates, two different fractions. Mitochondrial concentrates, and a, a new agent that I developed six months ago, really funny story behind that one. Um, it, it involves an interesting situation with a really vain patient that made me do something that I wouldn't usually do, and I got this new regenerative agent out of it. Um, then I do a life safe version of the fast grasper concentrate. And then adipose or, or fat, I'll make four different fractions out of that depending on what I'm working on in a patient. And then the two things that are, those are all what we call um, autologous or from the person. And then um, A cell and exosomes are allogeneic. The other allogeneic things that you're likely to hear out there are things like umbilical cells and amniotic tissue. Um, please don't get me started on that because I'll go into a <laughs> about why they should not be ever used. That's 12 years of experience right there. This is what I'm doing with people now. Um, it's only been six, eight months that I've been doing this. I'm pretty convinced that nobody out there is going to do this because 
hey, they don't have the skills to be there, sign away, let them do it. See, it takes too long. B, it's, they're never going to get a return money wise on doing this for somebody. But this is pretty much my paradigm for for any patient going forward. Because pretty much everything I do now is complex. All of 2020 is going to be seven different conditions, 20 patients each. One of them is for alone patients, and they all will be published at 6, 12, 18, 24 months for outcomes. So I'm only be taking 20 flaxes next year. So that's just craziness right there. The guys around the country that I've known for 10 plus years that I talked to about this, they're like, no, I would never do that. That, not, that doesn't mention all that stuff. to do regenerative medicine you can't live up to really 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 high standards that in personal opinion is a shouldn't be doing it i can be that biased i've been doing this for 12 years and i've created a lot but it's also with the eye towards i want to create <coughs> I can't teach other dogs. Mm -hmm. I care if you feel better, but not very much. Mm -hmm. I care that you're healing. And healing and symptom relief are not necessarily, not, are almost never the same thing in the first six months. It's a global approach, that's the takes ability to heal a patient. Having that sixth sense. Some people would say, well, that's just a lot of experience. And, you know, I've had surgeons say, oh, yeah, that's actually, you be, you're in the flow, man. You're in the zone. And I'll say that's direct inspiration working through me. Now, when I go through my other section of treatment, some of this was a little treatment oriented, but I'm going to start here for my treatment section. Um, and I'm only, only going to use upper cervical instability as my example because there's a hundred different things we could go over. And now we're going to take about a 10 minute break and then we're going to come back split into groups of three so pick five or six people get your tables together and we're going to put down on paper these are these are the appropriate uh, things that we need to do to assess for hormone toxicity and maybe even start thinking about what order we're going to do those things and and keep in the back of your mind collagen dominant neurologic dominant, mitochondrial dominant, and DNA dominant variants, because I see these variants in for hormone toxicity. And there's a lot of overlap between all of them. There's probably some of all of them in everybody, but I think there's going to be different ways to approach people based on how their, their dominance is showing up um, symptomatically. Um, that makes it a heck of a lot more complex, but at least keep it in the back of your mind. You can have a general you know, can you find protocol to start with and then start to create some derivations as we go. That was a lot to go through, a ton of information. He has been really attentive. I didn't have to use a stick on anybody. <laughs> um, we're going we're gonna to break a little bit, come on back, get that group of five to six, and we're going to start actually putting the pencil and the paper together, okay?